<laughs> Welcome everyone to another exciting uh, edition of the Magic Sandwich Show. Uh, I'm going to skip the usual introductions and announcements to later on during the course of the show, but I will just remind people that it is a live call-in show, and if you want to join the show, please send a Skype contact request to Magic Sandwich Show. Uh, include in that the gist of the topic or question that you would like to ask. If you do not do so, your contact request will simply be ignored. Um, we're going to kick off, uh, oh, I'm sorry, I should introduce the panel. Uh, to the usual suspects, Thunderfoot and uh, Concordance. And we're going to kick off with Concordance, uh, Concordance expanding upon the promotional video uh, that he made for this show. That said, Concordance, a lot of people may not have seen it, so you may want to start at the beginning, so to speak. Concordance. The origin of, of the video was about um, interviews with Alvin, and I'm going to pronounce his name the way I, I think it's pronounced, Alvin Plantinga. Uh, who is a, a very reputable analytical philosopher uh, with a strong Christian theological bent. And his position on the incompatibility between science and religion, uh, and the position that science can explain reason. Science can explain um, reasonable humans who can have true beliefs. Uh, and what struck me is just how similar it was to the discussion we had with Eric Hovind and Saiten Bruggenkate. In fact, the, the points were almost identical, uh, at least the conclusions that they arrived at. They came at it from slightly different angles, but the conclusion was essentially the same, and that is that we could largely dismiss atheism as the basis for any kind of logical discussion, because according to Sai and Eric, uh, we can't trust our reason because uh, we don't have the God of the Bible to cite as the ultimate source for our knowledge. Uh, Dr. Plantinga uh, also has the same basic thesis, except that he says that because our brains are the product of evolution, there's no reason to believe that evolutionary pressures would produce a brain that is capable of producing true beliefs that because the evolutionary pressure on our brains is simply favorable things, things that convey a fitness advantage, we can't assume that our brains are capable of true belief. However, if they are divinely created, we can. So it's the same argument from two very subtly different uh, points of view. And it struck me that in a lot of the arguments used by sophisticated philosophers and theologians um, of the type of Plantinga or one of his disciples, who was Billy Lane Craig, the arguments are not so different from what we hear from street preachers or uh, the shock of God type YouTube Christian uh, using these very easily defeated arguments. It's dressed up in different language, but the conclusions are very similar. Let, let me read a short section, just, uh, just a few sentences, uh, from an essay he wrote in 1991. And I, I want you to compare this against uh, creationist uh, videos you might see on YouTube, of the, the lowest intellectual level you can imagine. This attitude, the belief that when there is a conflict between science and faith, the problem must inevitably lie with our interpretation of Scripture, so that the correct course is always to modify that understanding in such a way as to accommodate current science is every bit as deplorable as the opposite error. No doubt science can correct our grasp of Scripture, but Scripture can also correct current science. If, for example, current science were to return to the view that the world has no beginning or is infinitely old, then current science would be wrong. So, it's, it might arrive at, a, at a, uh, this conclusion from a much fancier uh, set of language. It might employ syllogistic logic, but that segment could be taken from any, any <laughs> low-end creationist argument anywhere. But even if I were well, to understand the argument, my problem is, and this is a question I specifically put to side, how does he know it's a God of the Bible? And I don't think that there is an answer to that question. Save for the fact he says, well, his answer is it's been revealed to me in such a way that I know for sure. Well, I'm sorry. I, I just, I'm not buying into it. Thunder. Uh, well, yeah, I mean, I think the key point in the argument this guy is advancing is that word if 
well, you know, if the if science then decides that the Earth was flat after all, then the Bible would have been correct. But the thing is that um, ancient books can be right um, by um, a variety of reasons. Other people might have figured it out. They might have just simply guessed, or yeah, you know, might have just an inspired guess. Um, that doesn't mean that it's actually divinely inspired. And likewise, uh, if he were really onto something that, uh, you know, religion can sometimes guide science, just give us the list of examples. Um, you know, they're... they're uh, Their discoveries that the, Bi the Bible contain this scientific knowledge always come after the discovery in science. Yeah. Of course, right. It's reinterpreted in light of the discovery. I have a particular hypothesis here, and I want to advance this and, and see if we can do a little testing on it. And that hypothesis is that people like Alvin Plantinga are brilliant. They're, they're, they're at the top of their field. They are quite knowledgeable. They are not idiots. They are not um, people to be looked down upon. There's serious scholarship and academic uh, qualities. What I think this is is when you have someone who is brilliant but is handicapped by certain constraints. You know, their their logic is constrained in that it must conform to certain doctrinal uh, requirements. This is what you get. And I, I think what 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 I see in this is that the religious doctrine that he is constrained by limits him to making arguments of a certain type. And those arguments are not easily knocked down. Uh, don't get me wrong, they're, they're very sophisticated arguments, but they're always constrained by the source material. Like, like someone playing a video game where they only allow themselves to kill the enemy with headshots, right? They don't allow themselves to do anything else. Someone playing from a particular handicap. And maybe this is one of the harms of religious belief is it leads people down these paths. It handicaps the true potential of these people in that they're, they're forced into defending um, a poorly defensible position. Uh, planning is uh, maybe biggest contribution to the field of philosophy is his free will defense of the problem of evil or his uh, free will argument uh, in the, the theodicy. Uh, and it just barely manages to avoid making the problem of evil. And let me let me expand on it just just for a second. The idea was that you know the problem of evil is how can you have an omnibenevolent, um, omni uh, omnipotent God who allows evil to occur uh, and who will, who creates beings which are themselves capable of great evil. And his defense, and as I understand it, it is the best accepted defense of, of the problem of evil is that even an omnipotent being would be unable to create beings with free will who could not choose evil. And to me, that's, that's easy to prove wrong. I mean, you could come up with a very simple example of a world that this supposed God created that does have beings with free will but no evil, and that's heaven. Or the angels, right? And well, even the angels, some of them chose evil, but they had free will, and they were free of natural evil. You know, wh why are these arguments so flimsy? I have it's to, not, I have to agree. It's not that, smart. Um, the the free will in heaven uh, argument, I, I think, is a blinder. Thunderfoot, did you want to comment on that? Uh, what is this the one where um, uh, how can heaven how can free will exist in heaven if people are free will? Yeah, yeah, it's um, it's pretty difficult to reconcile that, isn't it? Um, in other words, if you can actually create heaven where people have free will and everything's great, why not just create that in the first place? Well, right, second, the Garden of Eden, you had people with free will, but no evil. And no natural evil either. So the natural evil, the, the, the evil that arises from nature, disease, um, 
hardship, starvation, all those things apparently arose as a result of the exercise of free will. Right? That, I, I, that I found a flaw in the argument, though, um, I think. Um, who says that bad things can't happen in heaven? Because actually, Concordance, you just mentioned the fallen angels. So they had mm -hmm. free will, they were in heaven. So it's, it seems clear that bad things can happen, evil can exist in heaven. I find yeah, it more no, interesting absolutely. to debate how many angels can dance on the head of a pin. Again, this is, this is really my, my primary hypothesis, is that the pro problem here is not that Plantinga is not a brilliant man. I, I honestly believe he probably is. Um, he seems very sharp, although <laughs> very mean-spirited. Uh, if you want to hear some of his comments about Dawkins, he's uh, particularly uh, witty put-downs of Dawkins. Let's, let's hear them. <laughs> let's see. Let me recommend Dawkins' book to you. It is brilliantly written, unfailingly fascinating, and utterly wrong-headed. It was second on the British bestseller list for some considerable time, second only to Mamie Jenkins' hip and thigh diet. <laughs> In other words, uh, you know, he, he's comparing Dawkins' book to uh, a hip and thigh diet book, uh, as though, you know, it, it's very popular, but so are, so are these uh, silly diet books. Uh, it's not that he's not brilliant. The problem is that the source material itself constrains what he is free to explore. If he came to a different conclusion, um, and this is that, that old discussion about the difference between science and apologetics. Apologetics starts with a conclusion and works its way back to a defensible position. Right? Science starts from the observation and works its way to the position that's consistent with reality or consistent with um, a logical basis. And that's, that's what I get from this, is no matter how brilliant you are, if you're given these, these handicaps of you have to defend this doctrine, then you, your arguments are not that different from idiots. What do you think is going on with, not so much him, but um, Sai, when he says, um, it's been revealed to me in such a way that I know? So to keep on going back to this point, but I think it's the... Um, it, it's his Achilles heel. Uh, well, do you think he's? Do you think, uses, well, let me, let me. My yeah. point is, do you think he's being genuine when, and truthful when he says that? Because I suspect he is. Um, in which case, are we missing something, or is he delusional? <laughs> let, let Let me read Plantinga to you, because uh, that argument from Sai is identical, or nearly identical, to an argument from Plantinga. Everything depends on the particular evidence adduced in the case of unquestion, and the bearing of that evidence given the believer's total evidence base. In the, the case in question, for example, it may be that given uh, evidence-based science and the relevant database, it's unlikely that Jesus arose from the dead. But given an evidence base including not only evidence-based science, but also belief in God, together with the specifically Christian beliefs that Jesus is the second person of the Trinity incarnate, I'm going to summarize this, this last sentence here. Given the New Testament and specific Christian doctrine, the proposition that Jesus rose from the dead may not be at all improbable. At all improbable that he rose from the dead. Given <laughs> that the New Testament is true, which is a properly basic belief uh, to him, uh, and that he is part of a, that he basically, that he is God. Look at that. That's the same circularity that we saw Sai advancing. You know, I know that God is true because without God, I can't know that he is true because he is true because he is, it's, 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 a, it's a circle. There's a lot of, uh, how should we say, um, pretty simplistic recycled arguments here. And yeah, when you're just reduced to my proof of God is that I believe God, in God, or that I have faith, uh, that's not terribly convincing to everyone else. I should mention that um, Plantic, at least, is is an intelligent design creationist type. Um, he, but I, I was just browsing his stuff. Um, he doesn't actually stick a pin in the board to say whether he accepts evolution. What he does say is that evolution isn't incompatible with the divine God in that 
a divine god could have created life that way. Um, so it looks like he's covering his bases there. Yeah, directed theistic evolution. Yeah, so yeah. either God designed it, which means God exists, or God designed evolution, which means God exists. Um, neither what, what do you think? Do, do you think that evolution necessarily requires an unguided process? Well, I mean, this this is the thing. Evolution can be run on uh, as long as you've got non-clonal reproduction and environmental attrition, you will get uh, evolution. And you could say that it's all designed, but that's just a re redundant tier on the top of things. It's a perfectly acceptable naturalistic explanation as it stands. Yeah, it, it explains everything that we see uh, from processes that we can observe. I, I'm always interested to see theists owning evolution. I mean, I, I'm happy to see that in the secular arena of education. I'm, I'm very happy to have allies um, on the theistic side. At the same time, though, they're tying their, their omnibenevolent creator um, to a process of death, uh, attrition, um, horrific suffering. Uh, you know, when you, when, you, when you put an agency behind a process that, that is driven by the death of the weak or the sick and a process that creates fantastic pathogens, it is so incompatible with a loving deity who values the suffering of each individual member of the group. When, when alternatives to evolution would exist that would reduce that suffering, yeah, Hitchens had a nice uh, take on that, that uh, the human race has been around in, um, argue its current state, that, that is the uh, state which has culture and art and uh, buries its dead, that sort of thing, for about 50,000 years. So God quietly sat by for 50,000 years whilst plagues of smallpox, the Black Death, and famine, famines ravaged um, both Europe and Africa. And only after 48,000 years of this does he sort of put up his hands and say, right, that's enough. Now I'm going to send uh, an emissary um, in the form of someone born of a virgin to get um, to give some fairly banal messages, then get tortured and killed. And then I will um, allow these people to go to heaven. Um, it's a pretty messed up uh, theology. Um, I, I don't see how you can easily incorporate, as Concordance was saying, all this death and suffering um, with um, Christianity and a benign we God we can conceive of a less harsh way of you know elaborating all this biodiversity uh, creating all these uh, various forms uh, beautiful beautiful as they are without having to have all the suffering and death and all the mass extinctions you know the fact that 99% of all the species that have ever lived have died off um, and of course they all live short nasty brutish lives it's only very recently that we've we've had what could be seen as a desirable life worth leading. Obviously, if you're a young Earth creationist, that uh, issue of sitting back, uh, arms folded with indifference for 48,000, perhaps 100,000 years, uh, doesn't apply, does it? All, all you no. have to deal with then is a global flood. Uh, right. And scales are much, much shorter. And, of course, he set everything into motion perfectly. Although the, and on, on top of this, it, the tree of knowledge and the serpent, but right, <laughs> without without um, without Adam and Eve, without a real Adam and Eve, because you don't get a real Adam and Eve with um, the theistic evolutionists. Then the whole basis of mainstay Christianity that Jesus was tortured and died for your sins goes out. Yeah, you know, the tortured for original sin. Goes out that's, the that's kind of only allegorical if it 
doesn't, you know how they interpret it in whatever way they want to. That's how we. Well, yeah, but then the then nation. Jesus gets tortured and killed for an allegory. Don't ask me to make sense of it. <laughs> Should we take our first caller, ADT? Yeah, let's do. It. Let's basically. do. It. Hi, welcome to the show. Um, hello. Good morning. Um, I guess I'd like to start by trying to answer Concordance's question of the difference between a street preacher and a sophisticated uh, theologian. And I think he did get it on the head when you uh, said it's essentially, you know, they are a lot smarter, they just have handicaps. Um, from terms of epistemology, um, in, in order to know something, there's three can, three things you need to fulfill. You need, In order to know something, um, you need to believe in it, you need to be justified in believing it, and it also needs to be true. Now, from what I see, the difference between your street preacher and uh, sophisticated theologian is they both believe in it, that's correct, and they both can justify it. Um, the difference is the street preacher probably justifies it with their Bible, whereas the sophisticated theologian has a more advanced justification of that, whether that's be through uh, more advanced arguments or syllogisms. But uh, in the end, neither of them have the truth. It's interesting. Plantinga never actually attempts to prove. Uh, he considers a belief in God to be, a, I believe, is called a properly basic belief. In other words, he believes it because he feels it, and he's comfortable with that. And that's the same argument that you get from the average YouTube theist. What's interesting about Plantinga is he never goes out with a positive assertion. It's always trying to save religious belief from di being disproved. And the latest threat, as he sees it, I think, is evolutionary psychology, which can explain the emergence of religious belief, the, 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 the adaptive value of religious belief. Um, and, and because we have an evolutionary explanation for how faith evolves, he specifically addresses that that's not proof that faith necessarily is uh, not a true belief. The fact that it's adaptive doesn't necessarily mean that it's not true. Uh, it's, it's, it's a very nuanced argument, but it, it boils down to the same basic thing. I know it because the Bible tells me so, and there's nothing incompatible between the Bible and what I observe in reality. You can't disprove it. It's really what his argument boils down to. Have we heard that before, right? Actually, yeah, I, mean, I think from my point of view, the way you determine what is right, uh, it's almost tautological that um, if you can actually get a description of reality that is useful, then that's what you call true. Um, because it's an accurate, it, it can be shown to be an accurate description of reality, things that are predictive capability, especially. And that's where all the theological predictions fall down, is they they have no prediction. So even though they might be true, uh, no one can actually get to the point where they're, they're shown to be true to the point where they have a utility. You know, they always remain in this could, um, could be true type reality. You know, this isn't my field, but what little I've read of it, planting as primary goal is to create a feasible or a rational possible explanation, a plausible explanation for how things could be. For, for example, you know, the, the free will argument creates the possibility, however improbable, that God had no choice in creating creatures with free will who were also capable of evil. It's not that he's asserting that that is the case, but it takes the ammunition away from atheist philosophers to be able to say the problem of evil is an irrefutable problem. It's a, it's a defeater argument. Um, and he, he, he has it as a deflector argument. And so there's all these references, and I, I don't understand the terminology very well. We should have gotten Michael Payton on here. Defeater deflectors and deflector defeaters. I, I don't quite follow it all. But it does seem to boil down to the, the Bible says it, and you can't disprove it in just very sophisticated terminology used by philosophers and, and analytic. Uh, yeah, um, I mean, it, it's trying to forever keep it in the 
it could be true. Right, um, right. You regime. can't disprove it. So that that argument, so right? Yeah, so you want your religion to be to claim as much turf as possible while still remaining in that region where it can't be proved to be wrong, which is why you've got to expand your, um, you got to try and expand uh, your God to include theistic um, evolution. Yeah, theistic evolution. Um, and there is this element that uh, that will keep some uh, Christians happy who wouldn't have been happy otherwise and the chances of them actually having come across uh, the counter arguments are pretty small so I, I think a lot of it is actually just about mm, uh, keeping doubting Christians happy well, on, on the topic of uh, the uh, evolutionary argument against naturalism that you're talking about, I actually like to bring that up. Um, I, I think I think it's a it's an interesting argument actually. Um, and as you said, he does throw his uh, proof from the Bible in, but the first part is solid. In the in the day that I've read it, I I've been thinking about it, but uh, it is it's it's something that that questions allows you to question. Um, you know. It provides that possibility. But anyway, I'll explain the argument for people who may not have heard it or may not have read it. Uh, this is coming from Wiki. Um, I'm summarizing it, though. Uh, essentially, what he does is he starts off by assuming that evolution is true. And then he says, well, if evolution is true, then our human cognitive uh, faculties must have been developed through the natural selection process. So our um, our, our survival, our... Um, Beliefs would have been developed um, in survi with survival in mind. So perhaps we have beliefs which allow us to survive more effectively. And the argument he makes is if this is the case, then these beliefs may not be true beliefs. They, there's a possibility that they could be false beliefs in order to help us survive better. And then he goes on to say, well, if there's a possibility of false beliefs, perhaps our belief in evolution is false, which is contradictory. Um, that's essentially his argument in a nutshell. Then he tags on the on in, in, uh, in another. On the other hand, if God created man in His image by means of evolutionary processes, then our faculties would be reliable. But it, uh, the first argument is the first part is interesting, I think, um, and, and it could be a possibility. Could evolution have given us a false belief of evolution? I mean, whether it's unlikely or not, I don't know. He goes into probability, um, which is debatable, but uh, it is just interesting. Uh, Hmm. What, what's what's your guys? Uh, I mean, this is the thing. We don't usually judge what's true on probability. We would judge what's true on whether it works or not, whether it can make the predictions. Um, and this is where the philosophy falls over. I mean, uh, you you can apply statistics to um, uh, systems that are known to behave statistically. But you don't apply statistics to determining the truth. One of the most staggeringly idiotic things I heard him say was that given any statement and its negation, I'm, I'm reading in a little bit to it, one of the two must be true. So either we, uh, our brains evolved or our brains didn't evolve. And if that's the case, then one of those two is true, so your, your odds, if, if the probability is low, are 50-50. Uh, <laughs> and I, I don't think that's right. I, I don't think you can arbitrarily give equal weighting to the truth of a statement or its negation. You know, that, that I, I, I'm still scratching my head on perhaps I'm misreading or misunderstanding what he was saying, but he said that any given statement is essentially 50% chance of being true if, if uh, natural selection is what determined our brains. Before and I come I, back to you, ADC, uh, but be, sorry, I thought you finished concordance, I apologize. No, no, I'm, I'm, it's, just, it, it, it's still oh, right. fogged my you, head I thought up. I think <coughs> was that me interrupting you. No. But one, isn't, um, isn't the, one of the failings of his position. If he, if he says, well, the, the mind has evolved and it may have evolved in such a way that we're left with beliefs that aren't true, that argu argument can be used against him and his belief in God, can't it? 
unless he relies on the it's been revealed to me in such a way that I know it to be true, which I find unpersuasive. I, have I got something wrong there? No, but he, he says it very on. persuasively. I mean, that, that, that is his argument, is that, you know, it's axiomatic. I, I, I know that this is true to begin with, then I can reliably trust my intellect. It, it, is, it is Psy's argument. And I, I don't know if Psy read Plantinga, and that, that's where he got the argument from uh, with some modifications. But isn't that, isn't that astounding that that argument came from such a sophisticated source? Um, DPR, there is actually a criticism on the artic article, um, and one of the things they do mention, uh, I'm just going to quote this directly from Wiki because um, I, I, it's, it's a bit of a negation, negation sort of thing, but um, he pretty much says uh, one of the responses that is equally a defeat of the theist who rely on their belief that their mind was designed by a non-deceiving god and neither can construct a non-begging question argument that refutes global skepticism. Um, so it's a sort of negation, negation there. But I, I, essentially, I think it's what you sort of said. You know, perhaps, perhaps they, their non-deceiving uh, God, um, could have imbued beliefs in them, which uh, I believe presents them from presenting an argument. Um, well, I, th I think I think also it goes further than that because I think that there's actually very good reasons to see why evolution would lead to a belief in gods, and uh, of course referring to uh, Andy Thompson's book, Andy Thompson we had on I think on the the first show uh, of this year, uh, and his book Why We Believe in Gods, the very good <coughs> sound reasons to uh, see why evolution would have led uh, led us to have a propensity to believe in gods. I'm not going to go through all the arguments, uh, and the show's obviously uh, still up and available on YouTube. I noticed that it was still being featured, so as I say, if you would like to uh, come and join us, you're joining the Magic Sandwich Show, which deals with issues of religion and science. It's a live call-in show. Uh, and can I just say, I've got about four um, people lined up already. Uh, I know we've got another four or five uh, requests. We will get to you as soon as we possibly can. Sorry, ADT, do go on. Um, yes, yeah, sure. Um like, I guess coming back from before, the argument that Concordance was talking about, where uh, uh, Alvin only gave two possibilities to a perhaps more complex issue, that's actually, uh, the, the reason that doesn't make sense is because it's a uh, argument from ignorance. It's, uh, I believe that's it. it's a fallacious argument where he's uh, said there's two possibilities and have constricted that. It's like, it's like saying that, uh, I think the example is, is if you go up to someone and say, well, if you're a homophobe, um, you must be against gay marriage. Therefore, you're not a homophobe, so you can't be against gay marriage. It's uh, making it seem as if there's uh, less options than there actually is. Um, correct me if I'm wrong. I'm pretty sure that's the ignorance fallacy. Uh, well, well, on that point, I will remove you, uh, but we will address that as I bring in the next caller. Thank you very much indeed for the call. Uh, does anyone want to address that as I bring in the next person? No? That's awfully rude of you. Sorry. Well, let's just hopefully move. Uh, it was a good on. point. <laughs> um, and now I'm going to get into trouble because I'll probably pronounce it Aaron, and he'll say it's Aaron. Uh, I don't know. We'll see. Hello. Welcome to the show. It's how Aaron. Would, how Come how would you like to be addressed? <laughs> um, I'm going to be here so that way you'll pronounce Aaron's name right. I am Aaron. You're not Aaron, just... rather then. No, no, no. Good. No, I have Arana the there. Arana Arana there, I think. <laughs> uh, plus, there's two A's, so it's a uh, uh, a run. I think the one of the old versions that shows how it's pronounced in ancient Hebrew is Aharo, but who knows? <laughs> I'm just going to call you AA. -A. <laughs> how can we help you, AA? -A? Uh, okay. Um, I've come across this argument from Plantinga before, and. Um, usually he puts it in his rather interesting form of epistemology that he's been working on since the 70s, but what ultimately gets me interested is the fact that actually, if you think about it, it should be proving that God doesn't exist based on his own argument. Since he's saying, well, evolution could possibly produce minds that don't come to correct beliefs, that don't have working sense organs, but God guarantees that they do work. But we happen to know psychologists have known for a long time this pile of meat makes mistakes all the time we have all sorts of psychological issues even normal folks like me see and hear things all the time that 
aren't real. Doesn't that at least suggest this thing doesn't work so well in that case if God what, is supposed to What sort to of things it? are you referring to when you um, say so you see and hear things? Are you talking about? I, I had the same thought, too. I mean, even like okay. optical illusions, right? Um, no, I mean... Uh, there's optical illusions as well, but I mean, you know, just you think someone calls your name, you see something in the corner of your eye. I mean, just even the normal stuff. I'm not even talking hallucinations or very well um, crafted um, optical illusions. Just you know, even day to day stuff where we make mistakes, we realize how fallible we are. But if our senses are supposed to be guaranteed to work, our thinking is supposed to be guaranteed to work, but we know from psychology that we don't see every, we don't actually think correctly all the time, we're loaded with cognitive biases, we remember things that didn't happen, or how vivid we remember has no correlation to truth, that wouldn't then uh, be what you expect on this God hypothesis, so it's evidence against, well, evolution would it kind of explain that, because, for example, we tend to see patterns that aren't really there, because in the natural environment, it's better to think you saw a tiger and run away, than not see it and get chomped on. So evolution explain God doesn't becomes evidence for naturalism against theism, planting a dug his own hole. I, I agree. I, I think agency detection, as an example, is the way our brains are structured as an adaptive trait, being able to detect agency, you know, thoughts in another head, was important for our social development but it makes us tend to put agency into inanimate objects. That's why you, you know, pound your fist on your car when it won't start. Obviously, it can't feel pain, but your brain is so wired by natural selection. And as Thunder would put it, which of those two models has greater utility to explain why we get angry at inanimate objects? Is it because God has created us uh, to have true beliefs about the feelings of inanimate objects, or is it an adaptive but false belief that inanimate objects have a soul or a personality or feelings or the ability to feel pain? Right. Obviously, one of those two is is much more compatible with with reality. <sighs> and we could add on to even more things that we don't so know, know uh, we, we know from psychology that just shows the wiring in our head makes sense of things, but souls or God believes don't well. You've probably heard of the Stoop, um, the Stroop test. I've never heard of that. No, I haven't. Tell us about it. Oh, me. Okay. Um, it's basically start flashing up words on the screen, and the word corresponds with the color. So you throw up the word red, and it's in red. Throw up the word blue, oh, it's right. in blue. Throw up yellow, it's green, and you're supposed to say, but you end up, when they start not matching, you tend to go with, I think, the color first rather than the word. Right. And it's really hard to do that. And when you do that, a crowd of people, everyone starts laughing when they screw up. It's explicable right. when you, you know, start covering up the brain and see, oh, it's because of this wire is longer than this one, etc. But again, doesn't seem to fit any sort of God hypothesis of guaranteeing that our senses work quite white, uh, quite, can't talk today, quite right. So, Aaron, why, why do you designed. think Plantiga it gets away with it? What? Why do you think that his argument is taken very seriously, given, I think, how easy it is to demonstrate it's false? Well, I don't know how popular it is amongst philosophers, even though, as you've mentioned, he's extremely well-respected. And the stuff that he did, especially on warranted belief, is still causing debate, as I understand. So there's that aspect. But um, it might also be in part because... Not everyone knows some aspects of the science. I should point out that actually Plantinga in his past literature and even current isn't so sure on if the whole evolution is true thing. He, in his stuff like in the 70s, 80s, dance like there's no transitional forms, the same BS we've been seeing for way too long. I think more recent stuff, he's not adamant about it, but he still keeps it as possible. So uh, it could be just that some people don't know the science so well on the psychology aspect, though. I doubt that amongst philosophers. They usually study their stuff well. Common folk like us, the, the lesser peoples that we are, <laughs> we are told he's great. We're told he's a professional philosopher, and that gives him great, great credence, and some degree deservedly so. He's definitely intelligent, but as I think you pointed out earlier, he's definitely working within a mindset where people want what he says to be true, ultimately. And 
this is why you know theology is harder to deal with sophisticated theology than say astrology because we don't have too many sophisticated astrologers because they don't have the giant amount of mental capital they don't have universities teaching it they don't have giant books of apologetics on it it's pretty much just left over by some people who know a little bit of astronomy and that's about it yes and as far as i understand um he's as good as it gets when it comes to christian theology stroke philosophy Thunder. not only that i mean when you actually take a look at these professional philosophers you take a look at their life's work it tends to be sort of banging on about a few points ad nauseum, and in Craig's case, banging on a few points that were um, sort of explored and essentially discarded a century or two ago. And this is the the realm of the professional philosopher. I mean, if you were to ask yourself a very simple question, what have been his contributions to philosophy? What are they? Well, there are several. I mean, there are several arguments he's made specifically around Christian theology. I mean, I, I, I don't think we should put any doubt that his contribution to his own perspective, his own position, has been substantial. I mean, he's got the evolutionary argument against naturalism, the E-A-A-N, and he's got the uh, free will defense theodicy, um, and a, a number of other things, too. Uh, he's been around since the 70s. He's made substantial contributions to the field of Christian philosophy, um, which I guess you can distinguish from theology somehow. C can I read just a really short section again? Uh, this is Please. directly from Please planting it. Yeah. The believer okay, in before God. Before you do, I have to jump out. It was good talking okay. to you guys, though, but duty calls Thanks, for, for me. Thank Thanks. you very much. Go on, Concorns. The believer in God, unlike her naturalistic counterpart, is free to look at the evidence for the grand evolutionary scheme and follow it where it leads, revising that, that scheme if the evidence is insufficient. <laughs> Yeah, she has a freedom not available to the naturalist. The latter accepts the grand evolutionary scheme because from a naturalistic point of view, this scheme is the only visible answer to the question, what is the explanation of the presence of all these marvelously multifarious forms of life? The Christian, on the other hand, knows that creation is the Lord's, and she isn't blinkered by a priori dogmas as to how the Lord must have accomplished it. Perhaps it was by broadly evolutionary means, but then again, perhaps not. At the moment, perhaps not seems the better answer. Come on. But Come that on. Is, <laughs> that is verbatim William and Craig, yeah? or Craig's lifted that sort of word for word. I think They're Craig both from the reform school. I, I don't know quite what that means, but l listen to that. That that's that's frank apologetics for for special creation, right? He's saying that you know only a Christian can truly evaluate the evolutionary argument because only they are unfettered by biases. Come but, on! But, but uh, it's a yeah, point you, you made about APR. You, you could make the same argument for astrology. That you know they they have more options available because they consider both the natural and the supernatural. Right. Therefore, they they have a wider, more open minds than everyone else. The mere yeah, fact absolutely. that every every proposed supernatural explanation has fallen flat on its face doesn't seem to bother these people. Welcome to the show, Gio Carlo. Gio Hello, Carlo. people. Hello. Oh Hello, people. Can you can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, very well. Oh, fine. Oh, um, I called in because uh, uh, the, the, the argument of uh, self-recursion uh, of concepts have come uh, out very, very often lately in your show. And I think that there is a, a brand new epistemology which can deal directly with this kind of arguments and prove, or better, disprove them in a pretty definitive way. If I can use this term, I don't know if it's correct, but um, it's called uh, complexity epistemology, and um, it started to, to, to be founded around uh, the 70s when, or the 60s maybe, when uh, higher level math, complex math, uh, chaos math, and uh, fractals on one side and system dynamics on the other started to, to work at, uh, at uh, part of uh, science that, was, uh, that wasn't very explored. It was uh, um, interrelation 
of uh, entities uh, and the, the study of this interrelation and the studies of the entities when this interrelation occurs. Uh, in, uh, in the USA there is a, there is a, um, a university called the uh, Santa Fe Institute for Complexity in some, uh, some texts that uh, this about these arguments, there is a Nobel Prize, Mr. Uh, Professor Murray Gelman, which is uh, leading this institute. And uh, in Europe, uh, there, there has been more uh, um, epistemo epistemologic studies of the arguments. In particular, Edgar Morin studied uh, complex logic. What, what's that? Well, it's a logic that doesn't start from a point and arrives to another, but works in circle in circles, okay? So how can we understand if a circular thought, if a thing that has no cause, no effect, uh, is real? Um, and there is uh, only one way to, to understand if a circular thought is real and is that of matching it with the other circular thoughts that compose our understanding of reality. If that thought matches everything we know, everything else we know about uh, how the reality works in this way, it's very similar to the currently available scientific methods, then it's true. If it stands on its own and, it's, and we are not able to connect this circle with other circles of thought, then it's false. It's a bit complex to, to explain that uh, in, uh, in detail. Uh, I, I, so, are you saying that circular logic is okay as long as it fits in with other circular lo logic? It's okay as long as it fits observation about reality that are transferred to other circular logics. I explain. If you, um, if you transform a, a system of equation in a graph, you obtain a circular graph. Um, it, it must be uh, a, a solvable. Circular graph is different from circular logic. Oh yes, unless uh, you put every element of the uh, of the logic in a node. Let's say that we uh, have to solve a problem like uh, we uh, was the, the 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 chicken born first than the egg. Okay, that can be solved because we see that we have the chicken and the egg, so we can solve this problem saying that uh, it can, there can be a first cause of the chicken and the egg. We must put the chicken and the egg in everything else we know about nature and understand. Just so we're clear, I mean this might be a bit of a redundancy, but the egg came first. There were eggs around long before there were chickens. Yes. but. The egg of the chicken. <laughs> However, uh, not because uh, there was never a first chicken born out of the first egg of a chicken. If there was egg, but uh, there wasn't a chicken egg. However, the point is, uh, the apologetic, uh, um, the apologetic uh, stance in which uh, we have a primary cause, we have a, a God that can justify itself, okay, Cannot be, cannot be fit in a logic where everything must be interconnected and you can't break a circle nor find an initial point. I'm just out of interest. Uh, uh, why, why do you use logic at all? Sorry? Why do you use logic at all? Well, Logic, uh, maybe yes. It's uh, it's a bit stretched of of a word in this case. Uh, but if you think of uh, non classical logic, like fuzzy logic, okay. And uh, just why use logic at all? Why why actually are you using logic? Logic uh, in the sense of what the word I'm using, or in the sense of uh, uh, I the procedure. The procedure. Why are you actually? Um, implementing this procedure you call logic. What's the goal? Uh, in the complexity science, uh, uh, these interrelations are being studied and they are uh, being studied from ecology to economics to uh, psychology to uh, 
So, so those are all, they're all actually achieving something of practical use, yes? Absolutely. For instance, for instance uh, um, as I said, um, some uh, Ilya Prigogine, I don't know if the term is correct, has uh, uh, a Nobel Prize on the com complex interrelations of the liquid in a state of chaos, of, um, of near to be chaos and of near to be boiling point and, and the interrelations and the vortexes. Are you talking about critical points? Yes, critical points and, uh, and chaos math and uh, these kind of things. But the point is that someone, in particular, Mr. Professor Edgar Moren, brought these uh, observations about uh, complexity in physics and uh, chemistry and uh, ecology and uh, sociology into uh, an higher level. If we see all these complexities and all this interrelation, all these loops, then create something real in reality, maybe there's something more to it and uh, we can create an, an epistemology sorry, on that circular concept. And uh, he made a work in, in six books <laughs> that is called The Method, and uh, the last book was, uh, was out in 2004, so it's pretty, pretty recent, even if the first work is uh, in the late 70s. And um, the point is that he finds some common patterns on, uh, on the fact that uh, everything we observe in reality is actually complex, exactly, exactly circular, it actually works uh, in a uh, complex, interrelated, exchanging, interconnected way. So maybe to study these complexities without breaking them down and making them simple, simple we have to cope our logic, our devices, our uh, uh, um, ways to uh, check the reality with this complexity. And uh, Gian this, Giancarlo, yes? I, don't, I don't mean to interrupt but I do. Yes. I think this might be better in a different format. I, I think this is, is um, a very technical discussion uh, on a very specific subject. I, I think we're looking more for, for generalized discussion. Going to the point of uh, how apologetics can be falsified by this, and it's very simple. Since, uh, uh, for instance, the, the, the assertion that uh, uh, God is uh, uh, true because it's God, uh, the, the, the ghost that never lies, uh, uh, how Thunderfoot says it, can be easily falsified this scheme because uh, it has no interrelations with the other concept. It wants to stand by itself. And making so, we can uh, say that being zero, it's interconnections with the, the uh, I, I, I have to say that I'm in agreement with, with uh, concordance. Um, so I, I'm, I'm grateful for the call. 